Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Kaylin. I am an incoming second year PhD student in History and African American Studies at Yale. I make academic lifestyle content all about my life as a graduate student, as well as tips and informational videos about how you too can access higher education, resources for receiving funding, writing, your dissertation, etc. I'm taking you along this journey as I experience it myself. And today I have a very important video for you that I've been wanting to film for a while. It is another take on a previous video that I did, which was 10 things I wish I knew before starting my PhD. But today I'm going to be focusing on 10 things I wish all incoming PhD students knew. The first year of your PhD is incredibly stressful and is very unique. The experience that you're going to have in coursework is going to be very different than you have in the other stages of your PhD. Of course, this is going to vary if you are studying in the UK, the EU, or abroad. But in the United States, the first year of your PhD is often related to coursework. My first year as a PhD student was rough. Not only was the first year of my PhD entirely online, but I felt incredibly isolated from my cohort. I went through a breakup. I was managing my business, except in consulting. I was also focusing on my research and trying to put together an article. So it was a bit hectic. In addition to sharing some of my own personal experiences, this video is really meant to provide you with advice as you go into your first year as a PhD student. So keep this in your back pocket and refer back to it if you ever need some support. Also, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any additional questions as well as anybody in your department that you think might help you. And now for a quick message about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. Additionally, this video is in collaboration with BetterHelp. BetterHelp is an online counseling service which connects you with a certified therapist in your state who also meets all of your various needs. When you go to sign up for BetterHelp, you take a quiz to figure out what type of criteria is gonna be important to you in helping them match you with a therapist. Oftentimes, we do not treat mental health and mental wellness as one of the first and foremost things that you need to be taking care of when you are going into a PhD program or you're heading into a rigorous job or just living in your daily life but as somebody who has experienced challenges with my mental health in this past year more so than I ever have in the past I have to say that working with counselors at BetterHelp has been so useful for me I personally was having challenges finding a therapist within the network available through my insurance plan and with BetterHelp not only have they sought out to pair me with a therapist that would work with me but also at an affordable price therapy is often expensive and is really challenging to access if you are a student or if you are from a low income background, but BetterHelp offers resources so that way you can afford therapy because they truly believe that everybody should have access to therapy and to be able to manage their mental health. So this was one collaboration that I am so excited about. This is a company I have wanted to work with since the first time I ever heard about them and also use the service myself. I have friends that use the service and when they reached out to me, I nearly jumped out of my seat because I cannot believe that they wanted to work with me on this video. So please feel free to check out the links down below if you wanna check them out. Take the survey and see what BetterHelp can do for you. Now, without further ado, let's get into the 10 things I wish that incoming PhD students do. Number one is that you define your own pace. As a PhD student, there is a lot of pressure in order to get your PhD done in a certain amount of time or to be hitting the same milestones as your colleagues. As a PhD student myself, I feel the constant pressure looking at my colleagues and seeing how much they're getting published or the conferences that they're speaking at or how quickly they're getting through the program. But you have to remember, this is your PhD. This is your education and it's also your project. As a PhD student you are working on developing knowledge in a new and novel way and you need to be the one to define your own path through the program and you also need to define your markers of success. You want to be able to support your colleagues and to cheer them on but also remember to keep blinders on and to focus on what it is that you are wanting to accomplish. Their pace does not define yours. So for example, I have a master's degree, in which case that means that I can actually finish my coursework a semester early if I wanted to and move on to comprehensive exam prep. But I'm not sure if that's the right path for me. I know many students that are in my cohort are considering this option who have master's degrees, but I'm not sure if it's right for me. At the end of the day, I have to be the one to decide, do I wanna take additional classes? Is there more that I feel like I need to be learning? What other things do I want to be working on? 
and working towards. There are many things that are gonna define your pace. That's going to include your advisor, the course structure, funding, personal challenges that you may face, and also personal life goals. There are many people that are starting families in their PhD programs, and that is also going to define the pace at which they are going to complete certain milestones within their program. Additionally, we're all going to end up in different places, either in the academy or outside of the academy. And so you want to make sure that you are defining your own path for yourself, because at the end of the day, it is you that is going to have to live with your choices and you're going to have to figure out how to best navigate not only your PhD, but what goes beyond your PhD. So keep on the blinders and focus on your own goals. Number two is to seek advice everywhere. One thing I did not do a very good job of when I got to Yale was that I kept to myself. I didn't ask for help. I didn't really go to the DGS office hours. I spoke to my advisor a couple times, but other than that, I really didn't connect with people in the program. And part of this was because of the online system and just the way that it was structured. But beyond that, I wasn't going out and networking in the same way that I would have. And one thing that is really useful not only to connecting with other people in a networking capacity, but also in an emotional and social capacity is that you want to be connecting with anybody that you can. This includes administrators, faculty members, cohort mates, people in other departments, because ultimately a PhD can be a very isolating experience, especially when you go ABD and having a wide net of people that you have connected with and have sought advice from is going to be super useful. Additionally, the more people that you talk to, the more you will know about your program, the way to receive funding, the way to receive resources. I wouldn't even know that there was a legal history form had somebody in my cohort not told me. So in order to have those connections and in order to learn about events and different opportunities, you need to be connected. Number three is very closely connected to number two, which is to advocate for yourself and reach out. One thing I did not do a good job of this last year was actually going to public events and reaching out, following up afterward. One thing I did in undergrad all the time was reach out to faculty members that were at different universities or graduate students to ask for advice or ask about their research or their current projects. And this is not something that I did this year and I deeply regret it because there are so many missed opportunities when you do not go to these public events and you do not follow up. If you go to a talk and there is a scholar who gives a speech or a presentation that you really felt connected with and that you want to know more about, reach out to them. I have to say academics are the most easy to flatter people on the planet because they don't get it very often. So the, a way that you can connect with people beyond your own department or beyond your university is to go to those public events and then follow up with them afterward. Let them know what you liked about their work. Additionally, a piece of advice that a previous professor gave me, thank you, Dr. Kyle Mays, was to reach out to the people that you admired their work. So when you read a book for a class or for your comprehensive exams and you really connect with it or you think that you may cite it in your work, reach out to that scholar and let them know what you liked about the book. Be specific. Don't just say, I really enjoyed reading your book. Go beyond that. Tell them what it was that you connected with. What was it about the sources or the argument or the data that you really found was interesting? Not only will you have reached out to them to let them know that their work is important, but this may be somebody that you will connect with in the future and they may remember this correspondence. So reach out, advocate for yourself, and be sure to make those connections wherever you can. Number four is to get involved. This can include getting involved in social events, social gatherings with your cohort. This can also include things like being on advisory committees, diversity committees, or joining your local union. This is something that I was focused on when I got to Yale and was one of the most enriching experiences that I had in my first year. I was part of the Graduate Student Assembly, the Graduate Student Advisory Council for my department, as well as the Diversity Committee. I also joined the Graduate Student Union here at Yale, which is called Local 33, and attended various workshops, including the Yale Early American Historians Group, as well as Race and Slavery, which is another working group. Joining working groups and other types of collaborative events and seminars is going to be a way that you can not only connect with people, but it'll also be something you can add to your resume. Joining in an advisory role may also provide you with skills related to communication, as well as how to actually establish events and make connections. This is going to be really important, not only for you to get to know people in your department, but beyond your department as well. So be sure to go to these types of events and to get involved. My apologies, we had some technical issues and now I'm re-recording the second half of this video. So moving on, number five, diversify your skills. 
As a graduate student, you have gone through undergrad, perhaps a master's degree, and now you're beginning your PhD and are thinking ahead as to where you may land on the academic job market, or you may be even considering going out into industry. But one thing that you may want to consider is diversifying your skill set. So you already know how to perform research. You know how to work in a lab, you know how to write, you know how to get published, or maybe you're learning. But in the future, you're going to want to be able to market your skills to a wider audience and be able to demonstrate that you have skills beyond the academy. This is even more pertinent in today's job market where things are very competitive and when you are entering the job market against your colleagues, many people have very similar skill sets, very similar interests, and you're all vying for the same job. So one thing that you can do to differentiate yourself in the future is by having other skills, other experiences, a slightly unique professional background in order to differentiate yourself. So how do you do that while you're in a PhD program? Well, one thing that you can do is use your time in your PhD program while doing archival research or doing field work in order to gain other types of research positions outside of just your own dissertation. Another thing that you can do is reach out to your career center at the graduate school within your university to see if they have professionalization workshops or fellowships where again, you can expand your skill set. So that way you have a resume that reflects not only your abilities as a researcher and a teacher, but also as a professional and as somebody that has organizational skills and the ability to work on multiple projects. Number six is perhaps the one that is not spoken about nearly enough, which is to connect with a therapist before you start your PhD. This is something that I've seen circulate on academic Twitter, and that is the idea of trying to get connected with a therapist or a counselor prior to starting your PhD. One reason being that in the fall is when many people are signing up for therapy, in which case the calendars of local therapists within your insurance network may be limited. So one way to mitigate this is to look for therapists, for example, at BetterHelp, or to look at your network before you actually begin your PhD. Do your research ahead of time to see what processes are required in order for you to get connected with a therapist. Additionally, think of therapy as more of a preventative measure rather than something that you only seek out in an emergency. I used to think of therapy as something that you sought out when you were going through something and you really needed help. But as I've gone through my own mental health journey, I've recognized that the coping mechanisms that you need in order to get through those times of grief or crisis or depression or depressive episodes, that having those skills and having something to rely upon beforehand is key. Starting with a strong foundation will allow you to work through certain challenges that you may face in your first, second, third plus years of your PhD. Additionally, this will help you in thinking about how it is that you wanna communicate with your therapist before starting, as well as get on a regular schedule. Once the semester starts, everything that you think that you wanted to get done, including finding a therapist, often goes out the window. So one thing that you can do is take the preventative measures by seeking them out ahead of time, making sure that you're finding the right fit. Sometimes you need to change around therapists in order to find one that works for you. So be sure to take your time, do this before you get started, and once your insurance plan kicks in, then it begins searching. Number seven is to think ahead about funding. In the first couple years during coursework and during your comprehensive exams, you may begin thinking about what it is that your dissertation will shape up to be, but many people forget that one of the primary components in your ability to finish your dissertation or even to get started is funding. This will include things like travel grants, research fellowships, etc. So you want to make sure that you're thinking ahead about those deadlines and making sure that you have all the components and the communications necessary in order to fill out those applications when they're due. Sometimes this may not be until your second or even your third year of your PhD, but it is important to start looking at where the money sits within your university. Is it offered by the department? Are there state grants? Are there publicly funded grants that you're going to need to tap into? Are there institutes within your university? that people tend to seek out money from. These are things that you should start asking early and start asking of other graduate students as well as professors. Graduate students in particular are the most familiar with these processes and they've most recently gone through and filled out these applications and sent them in for approval. So one thing 
that is super useful is by talking to them and asking where the money lies within your institution. And though you may not need it right now, this is something to think ahead about for the future. Number eight is to meet with your advisor. In the first couple years of coursework, sometimes you are not necessarily assigned to your advisor. You may have applied to work with somebody when you came in, but it may not be directly specified by your program who it is that you're going to be working with. That being said, you likely indicated the person that you would like to work with and are beginning to think of who may sit on your committee. So in the beginning, when you're starting coursework, begin taking classes with the people that you believe are going to be on your committee and the person that you think is going to be your advisor in order to develop that relationship early. In my experience, I knew who my advisor was when I came in. I have met with him on multiple occasions throughout my first year. He's been incredibly supportive and I have taken a class with him. And I can say from personal experience that having that communication and having him as a point of contact to say, hey, I'm thinking about taking these classes or I'm thinking about taking on this opportunity that he is somebody that I go to for advice. Additionally, my advisor is someone who makes me aware of certain opportunities, for example, leading the Race and Slavery Working Group or my research position that I just started. So make sure that you develop your relationship with your advisor or possible committee members ahead of time so that way you are privy to certain opportunities as well as to develop that repertoire for communication. Number nine is to talk to your cohort. So I actually have two cohorts because I am in the joint degree program between history and Africa. African American studies. And during this past year, I have been more in contact with the African American studies cohort because I found that because it's a smaller group, we tended to communicate more often. We actually put together a little personalized seminar between the eight or nine of us that we would meet every other week and go over somebody's work or have a presentation. And this was a way that I stayed in touch with them even when we were online. But I felt really disconnected from my history cohort this last year. And I thought that this was because maybe I was being left out of the loop, but really everybody in this last year of being online has been very isolated. We had some people in our history cohort which were not able to make it to the United States because of visa restrictions due to COVID. And for those that were here, we felt unsafe seeing each other in person because we wanted to make sure that we were being cognizant of the current health crisis. Now that we are all vaccinated, we've started to hang out and I felt so alone this last semester, but now being able to talk to them about the things that I was experiencing and realizing that I wasn't the only one, it has been so positive for my own mental state and my overall emotional well-being. And there was a time this last year where I wasn't sure if this was the right thing for me to be doing. I felt really out of place and I felt like I was the only one feeling this way. But after getting to actually talk to people in my cohort, I realized I wasn't the only one feeling that we were not meant to be here or that the coursework was even more challenging than usual or that our writing wasn't the quality that we were wanting. I felt so relieved getting to meet with people and talk to them about my own experience and realize that they were going through the same thing that I was at the same time. And so being able to communicate with people that are at the same stage of their education that you are is going to be really important in order for you to kind of maintain your sanity. But also they're the people that are going through similar experiences, they're trying to hit similar milestones. And while you're all on your own separate paths, having people that you are cheering on and that are cheering you on is going to be so, so important throughout the time that you are a PhD student. It is a lot easier to make friends with your cohort when you are in person in coursework rather than when you separate during ABD or when you are all but dissertation. So make sure to make those connections now so that way when you do go off in your separate directions for research that you are still connected somehow. And last but not least is number 10, which is to have a life outside of your PhD. I know that people say this a lot and I see it all the time on academic Twitter. I've definitely said this before, but I want to encourage you to think about what your life is like outside of academia. And beyond that, don't just think of this as your social life and your family, but beyond that, having hobbies and other passions beside your research that will keep you activated. I truly do not know where I would be within this program if I didn't have my YouTube channel. YouTube has been my creative outlet, being able to connect with you guys and build community, also building up a community through Accepted Consulting and our Accepted Society program has been so gratifying and I have felt so much more connected to people even beyond Yale than I ever have before. Two of my best friends right now, Katie and Danielle, are people I met 
online. Up until a couple months ago, I had never met either one of them in person. And I have to say that having that outlet, having those friendships outside of the academy or outside of Yale was so important to my mental state throughout this time. And I truly don't know what I would do without them. So whether it's video games or reading fiction or going surfing or like you like going skiing, whatever it is, have a hobby, have something that you were in love with that you were excited about outside of just your research because it will keep you grounded. It'll keep you going. There is this stigma of wanting to continue to produce, but when we only look at our research and we don't look away, not only are we missing out on opportunities for various perspectives to engage our work, but also we burn ourselves out on our work. And we love the research that we do. We don't want to burn out on it. We want to enjoy the time that we get to spend doing research and being in these programs and having a life or having things that you feel passionate about besides your research does not make you any less of a researcher. If anything, I think it makes you better. It's through YouTube and social media that I have made connections that have actually led me to archives and resources and public talks that I wouldn't know about had it not been for you guys. I've gotten messages from people saying, hey, there's this program at the Legal History Forum at Columbia and this professor that you mentioned in a video is speaking there. There's a public link, you should go. I wouldn't know that that was even an opportunity if I didn't do YouTube. I wouldn't be aware of all of these other things that could be enriching my academic experience and my research had it not been for having a life outside of academia. And so I highly encourage you to focus on setting aside time, not only to rest, but to truly develop your passions while you're in these programs. You've worked so hard to get here. So make sure that you are enjoying your time. We're gonna be in these programs for a long time. PhD programs are a long haul, especially in the United States where they're between five and eight years. So make sure that you're making the most of it and taking your time, enjoying the time that you're spending in your PhD, making friends, developing connections, developing your thoughts and your research and seeing where it takes you. All right, everyone, we have now come to the end of today's video. I hope that this was useful for you. And if you are currently a PhD student and you have any advice that you would like to share, please drop it in a comment down below. I'd love to see what you would recommend as well. These are pieces of advice that I'm still taking on board myself as a second year PhD student. And I look forward to seeing what this next year has in store. If you liked this video, please remember to give it a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button if you are yet to subscribe, and I will see you all in the next video. Thanks everybody.